Welcome to People Love Process. For the last three years, I've created a design based on the current Lunar New Year theme. This year is the Year of the Tiger. Tigers are always a fun theme to work on, so let's jump right into it. This is the three designs I've previously done based off of uh, the themes for those years. So you have the Year of the Pig, the Year of the Rat, and the Year of the Bull or Ox. And those were a lot of fun to create. So we're going to do a tiger. Now, if you don't think you're proficient with drawing, the best place to start is to start with reference. Look at the real world. Doesn't matter if you're drawing realistically or in this case, more stylized. It's going to help you figure out what makes, in this case, a tiger look like a tiger. Uh, the best in the world use real world reference. If you've ever had a chance to rent uh, the DVD for The Lion King, there's a great bonus movie on that that shows uh, the Disney artists at a, a wildlife park and they're just sketching based off of the lions they're looking at. So uh, can you draw a cat in general or a lion in general if you think about it? You probably could. It probably wouldn't look great if you don't draw all the time, but if you looked at reference, it's going to give you those characteristics that make, in this case, a tiger a tiger. Uh, this is my crude sketch, my thumbnail sketch, if you will, when I started working on this. Obviously, I knew this kind of was the essence of what I wanted, but not exactly what I wanted. So I just have to uh, keep drawing. I thought with this one, I need to make him look more fierce. So his eyes need to be more intense and you need to see more of his teeth and he need to look not necessarily as he's growling or, or roaring, that is, but he's, you know, he's kind of a fierce looking creature like uh, tigers are. If you look at the reference on the two images uh, in the middle and at the bottom on the left. So this is where I'll start redrawing again. And so this just uh, shows my rough sketch. And this is where um, I dialed it in a little more. And this drawing is a progressive skill. You draw, you keep drawing, you erase, you redraw, and you just keep trying. This is why I like drawing in analog because I draw on, it's not tracing paper and it's not vellum. It's a translucent stock that Nina Paper makes. I've been using it for 20 some years now. It's absolutely awesome because you can race and it doesn't like tear the paper. And so I've been using this for years and I'll just slap a new sheet on it. I have a light pad I draw on that's about a half an inch thick. Um, that's awesome as well. If you prefer drawing digitally, it doesn't matter whether it's digital, whether it's analog, drawing is gonna help you work it out. So this is my rough sketch. I thought I was getting closer. And so this is where I just draw it again in a more refined form. Now, all along the way, you wanna be art directing yourself. And so I didn't think this was bad. I think the, I, I almost started on it and then I'm looking at the eyes and I'm going, you know what? I, I think I can improve on that in other areas. And so specifically on his, uh, his teeth, I didn't think I had enough teeth in there. It just looked like a couple fangs on the top. So I want to add more teeth in. So I do another refined sketch and I think this is going to work a lot better. Now, previously, if you go all the way back to my rough, look at the eyes. It looked like he was deranged. And so on my final refined sketch, you can see I kind of brought those down on the top to make it look more fierce. So it's that kind of art direction. You want to get better at doing that with your own work. That way, other po people won't feel obligated to do it uh, on on. Uh, for you. And so this is where I'll take my sketch. I scan it in. I use a flatbed scanner, scan it in usually 600, 800 PPI. I'll center it on the document in this case. And then all I'm going to do once again is adjust the layer opacity to 15% on this and just lock the layer so I don't move it as I build. And then on top of this, one of the first things I'll do is I'll look at a design and figure out what can I create with basic shapes where I don't have to even touch the pen tool. Well, obviously his eyes and some of these elements I'm gonna have floating around him, so those were easy. Now, when it comes to complex paths such as vector, let's go ahead and zoom in on this a little bit. We'll zoom in on his mouth here. You can see I built this path. 
Well, this is one continuous path that makes up the shape of his nose, and then it starts into the shape of part of his mouth. And it's easier to build like this because what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to zoom in. And a lot of people don't really use the scissor tool whole much. I, I use it a lot because um, I think in shapes as I'm building, and I know it would be easier to make all this, the continuity of how one element flows into the next element is by creating it in one path. Then I'll take the, uh, in this case, the scissor tool, and with smart guides turned on, command U to turn it on, command U to toggle it off. Um, if you hover over a path, notice it's saying, hey, these paths are intersecting. That's great. That's where I want to click with my scissor tool and it slices it. So if I go ahead and select this, you can see it's only selecting the part that is the nose. And this is where I'll go into isolation mode. I'll double click into the shape just so I don't interact with this shape. And then all I'm gonna do is take my pin tool and I'll continue from this anchor point, bring this out and close it like that. Once I've done this, then I'll just go to my Pathfinder palette and I'll go Unite and that will take care of this shape so I can select it now and just delete it. So all we have now in the end is just the closed nose shape. That's why I did it that way. Now on this shape here, this is the one we're going to build from. So I'm going to cre create this and kind of continue the path up here. And what we're going to do now is I'm just going to create, let's zoom out. We're zoomed in quite a bit here is I just want to create the, the element that goes up his nose. It's going to go over to his forehead and start cascading across the top of his forehead and down to the right side. So that's all we're going to build is we're going to build the path to do that. And so I tend to zoom in on areas where I'm going to build. We'll go to the pen tool. We'll start here like this. And here I want the tangent to start from his nose. So we'll snap it to that. And then this is such... A shallow curve here I'm not going to put an anchor point here I'm going to go all the way up here by where his eye is and we're going to find an anchor uh, not an anchor point but we're just going to snap to this path right about I'd say right about there would be fine and then we can just continue this can be loose because all these shapes that make up his eyebrow are going to be sitting on top of it so it really is not going to matter at this point so we'll go up here and I'm just going to continue building and I'll find an ideal location to start this curve. So we'll go here. It's going to arch up over here. But what I'm going to do is I'm only going to go to this point here. And I'll explain that in a little bit. We're going to go down here and I'm going to adjust this now. And we're going to go to uh, uh, the PathScribe plugin, which is what I use. If you're going to do it natively in Illustrator, just use the... Uh, anchor point tool this allows you to grab a path and you can move it and so what I usually do if I'm going to use that not my plugin is I'll just barely move it to get access to the the handles and then I'll control how that path is shaped by using the handles it's just easier in my opinion to do it that way we'll go ahead and move up here you can use the same anchor point tool grab a path once the handles are pulled out then you can adjust it in my opinion, with more precision by adjusting those handles to get that curve. Now, the reason why I'm not coming all the way down here, um, that you can see this transcends the, the outer shape here. And this is where I would take a shape like this, I would copy it. And then I would move it to an uh, move it to another layer. In this case, we're going to go ahead and turn off these um, layers right now, and I'm going to turn off the mouth layer. And you can see I have this shape already created to get the inner profile, but I've copied the previous shape, so I'm just going to paste it in place. We don't need all of this, obviously, so I'm going to lop it off here. Then we can select this and just get rid of it. And we'll come back to that. I just want to show you that because that's what I do at times. I know I'm going to need the, sh the same path for another usage. So that's why I did that. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Let's go back to these. We'll turn them back on. And on this one right here, I don't need it to come all the way here since I copied that shape. I'm just going to go ahead and remove it. 
and it'll go back to this anchor point. And if you don't want this handle out, all you have to do, go to the anchor point tool and click on it and it'll retract it. And you'll wanna, you'll wanna do this. Now, when I'm building like this, I use a combination of freeform building, which I created everything you see selected here using the pin tool and Bezier curves and controlling them uh, with the Bezier handles. But at times I wanna create other content with shapes. And I know that, so I don't want to continue this path over here because right now I have this curve that comes here and it goes into the crease on his head. And I want to address that later. So I just want to focus back in on building this shape. So we'll start down here where we uh, stopped off at. And I'm going to go ahead and click here. We'll put an anchor point here. I pull it out just enough like this and I get to this point like that. Now I'll go ahead and control it with the Bezier curve like this to get that curve worked out like this. Now, whenever something comes to a point, it gets a point. Those are easy to discern. And this is where I switched to a plugin by Astute Graphics because I actually, I didn't even know this plugin existed or this tool within the, the subscribe plugin existed until like five years after I had it or something like that. It was an insane amount of time. I'm going, are you kidding me? And it's because I can do this, click, click on the next anchor point, and then I just curve it, done. Click, click, pull, done, click, click, pull, done. And you can see how much faster this goes than just using the standard pin tool uh, to create those. Now, when it gets into a shape like this on his chin, where it's like a giant S shape, this is where I'll go back to my pin tool, and this is where I'll discern to place my anchor points. In this case, we'll want one at around this tangent, and we'll put one up here around this tangent, and then we can create this with the Bezier, wherever it comes to a point, gets a point, and then um, you can either go to the anchor point tool, but I even use a plugin called Passcribe because it gives you these ghost handles, and I can just pull out uh, the curve using that to get that curve, we'll go down to here. I'll pull this out, finesse that a little more. And we could probably get this curve by just pulling this one out like that. And I'll adjust this one like that to get those curves. Now that I'm back at this point, this is where I'll go back to that plugin again because it just allows me to create more precise curves like this without having to finesse any Bezier curves. So it, it, it's kind of this process that I've, I've gone into now for the last, oh, it's been at least two years now uh, where I do this. So I just wanted to show you that because um, it's like working traditionally with the pen tool and then using a plugin and then going back to the pen tool, then using a plugin. Not only that, it's at this point, now that I have this, I'm just gonna go ahead and close the shape and I'm not worrying about the backside of his head because once I have this shape created like this, I can just go to uh, another shape I created like this because this gives me the whole back of his head, but notice it also comes in and it's gonna work as the crease. So this is a good example of a shape that I'm gonna copy and reuse later and not get rid of it. But for this, I'm just gonna select these two shapes and go ahead and unite them to get the full shape of his head. So um, I just wanted to show you that because it, 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 that's this is literally the way I work to create art like this just because it's easier. And now later on, you're gonna see me add that crease in and I'll be using a shape I derived from the shape I just merged or united uh, with this shape. Now we can go back to the mouth here. And of course we have this shape. So let's go ahead and zoom in here so you can see what's going on. So we had uh, this shape. Actually, let's just turn off this background shape. That way you can see this easier. And I'm just gonna go ahead and close this shape like this. Doesn't have to be any more precise than what I'm doing it, like that. So if I go ahead and fill this with gold, you can see what I've created there. This is on top of the inner part of the mouth, like that. And then I'll just go minus front to get that detail. 
So that's how one shape will be used for one part of the design. I'll make a copy of it to use it to edit another shape to create all the content I need. So when it's all said and done, uh, in case of this design, I have all my base vectors created and you can see this extra shape right here. And so once I get all my base vectors established, uh, this is where I'll start breaking the design up into a certain layer order uh, just to make coloring easier because not everything needs to be on the same layer. And I might compose things to be behind certain shapes just because it makes it easier to um, construct the overall design. So that's what I'm going to do now. So all I'm going to do is turn on the layers I need. So we're going to turn on uh, this head layer. We'll turn on the tiger face and we're going to be using the total family uh, to start coloring it. Now on this tiger, I want this tiger to be a nice kind of reddish orange. Um, not completely true red, but it has enough uh, oranginess to it. I don't even know if that's a word, oranginess. Anyway, we're going to color it, color it, uh, this color here. I think this is going to work good. And this is where just uh, coloring a design like this, uh, that's all I'm going to do now. I'm going to select all the areas I want black. And namely, this is where um, all the areas of the design you can see. Oops. I don't want those areas black. So let's go ahead and direct select that. I accidentally just selected the whole group and we'll use the eyedropper to color it. So his stripes, obviously a tiger in his stripes. Um, let's go ahead and zoom in just a little bit, get this a little larger on screen. So it's easier for you to see. And we'll select the pupils of his eyes. Those will be black, of course. I think these little stripes should be black as well, like that. And his whiskers, we'll make those black. His nose, black, like that. I think that's fine. We'll go ahead and make his eyes nice golden color. And if you ever look at the reference of the tiger around the eyes, these shapes, uh, what really makes their eyes intense is that they're surrounded by black. So definitely want to make that black as well. We'll make a little tuff of hair under here black. We're going to get a little creative with his lips. We're going to make that blue. Then we'll take the inner part of his mouth. That'll be black. We'll take the tongue. That'll be this... Um, I almost said tongue color. That'll be this like kind of muted uh, pink. And now we'll start uh, adding some of the other colors. Now, even though most of the, the I, I don't even know if they call them eyebrows, the area around the eyes are white, we're not going to make it white. We're going to actually color it red. And because we're using global colors, we're going to make it a tint. So it's not distinctly, it's like an off-white. And in this case, it's 10%. And I think that looks a lot better and then we can select these shapes and we can just get rid of the outline on these and these will be white so it almost serves as a, a highlight of sorts now we can go down here to the bottom part of the eye here and instead of being white on these we'll go ahead and color these red as well and adjust the tint and we'll do about 15 percent on that i think that looks good because this cheek color is kind of further in the background we're going to make it this darker hue of the red just to push it back a little bit we'll do the same thing with this ear since it's further away from the viewer we'll select this shape uh, because the inner part of the ear will be uh, will be black We'll select the top of the ear here. We'll color it that color. But in this case, I don't want a 100% value. So we're going to go to 90% tint, just so there's a little contrast between the two. We'll select the inner part of the ear. That'll become uh, red as well. But the inner part of the ear, we can, um, we're just going to go ahead and let's match that. Maybe, yeah, I think that's fine. So it's white. 
Uh, they usually have tufts of fur in their ear, uh, but we don't want it uh, full value white. And then the other thing we're going to do is on the teeth, the, the teeth are white, obviously. Oops, I forgot one area. Let's do the back part here. Dark, red, too. We can select the teeth here. If I color these blue, obviously that doesn't look good. So what, actually, I only wanted to color the back teeth blue. So let's go ahead and color these what I want to color them, which is white, like that. And then on these back teeth here, um, we're going to color these blue. But once again, we're going to do a tint. And so we're going to do, I mean, it's a really like off white almost five, six percent, probably five like that. And you can see it's just barely a contrast. And that's OK, because the background is going to end up being uh, a color anyway. And so the next thing we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and color um, uh, th their their muzzle. I don't even know if that's the right term for it. Um, their uh, cheeks, lips. No, this is their lips. Whatever the the snout. I guess the snout area. A tiger isn't all red though. It has uh, it, it kind of breaks up his face with white. So I've created that shape here. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to select this shape and I'm going to make a copy of it. Command C, Command F. It makes a copy of it. If I pull it out, you can see that. I'll select this shape. We'll just intersect it. And this is where instead of blue outline, obviously, we'll want to make this a white like that. And I think that looks, uh, that looks good. Uh, we're going to also go in on the um maybe on the, the left side here this would be white as well and i think at this point we can turn on the background like that so you can see these areas um i i think this should be probably a little darker since it's further away like the ears so we're going to color it gray that might be a little too dark let's let's adjust the the tint on that oh that actually, uh, maybe we what, mm, maybe ten percent, something like that. I think that works, like that. So it's at this point now. I'll start working in all the other details. So or all the other elements. So we have all the free floating elements that go around the side like this. Uh, but the next thing I want to show you is why I saved the shape. So let's turn this on. You can see the crease up here. And so this is why I do this. It's because I knew I wanted to crease because if you look at tigers, their head isn't perfectly flat on top. It kind of has a bend in it and it has this kind of crease. So this is where I'll save a shape like this because there's no reason to recreate the wheel. And if you think through your design, you'll be able to do this as well. And so I'll save this shape. Now I'm going to go back to that same tool I did those arches to. And I'm just going to snap on this one. And I'm going to go up here to where it hits the, the anchor point here. And I'm going to pull this shape out kind of like that. And then I can go ahead and close this. It doesn't have to be perfect like that. So with this shape I saved, let's go ahead and fill that with the colors so you can see what's going on. Make sure it's on top of the other one. Select both, minus front, like that, and we get this nice little sliver. Now that we have that, let's go over to our swatches palette or our swatches on the desktop here. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this shape. And I'm going to drag it up here right next to the base color. And we're going to create a shading color. That's all I'm going to do now. Is So what I want to do is I want to go into color here. You can see the break it is. Click on CMYK. And we're just going to adjust the values on this. So on this one, I'm going to cut the values in half. Instead of 7, we'll do about a 3. Instead of 100, we'll do about, I don't know, 45, maybe 46. Again, on this one, 45, 46. And you can see we're just muting the value here. And then on the K, much like traditional, and this is why I like working in CMYK, 
if you think like traditional pigments, if you're painting, how do you make a hue value uh, darker? Well, uh, you add more black to it. We're going to add a little bit more black to this. So I'm going to bump this up to 26 like this. So why did I do that? Because we're going to use this to uh, shade the color. If I select this and drag it over the base and go to the transparency palette and set the value or the blend mode to multiply, you can see you get a nice value of shading. And then you can control the intensity by controlling the opacity. So maybe on this one, I do 75%. Oops, let's do that again, 75%. And you can see how you can control uh, that specific hue. So now if I go and select this sliver that I did on the head and I apply that value, it creates that nice, um, uh, that nice detailing. Now, it was at this point that I'm working on it that I realized, you know what? I don't think I like all of these being black. It's too stark. So I'm going to select all the same color. I have an option F1 key set up to do that. I'll deselect these. I don't want those to change, but I have this nice blue. It's like a dark, dark blue. And I'm going to apply that and oops, it's selected as cheek. Let's make sure we don't have that selected. And I'm going to apply it instead of the black. And I think this looks a lot better with that blue. It even looks good on the crease because it changes that color as it goes through that area, which you couldn't really notice uh, with the black anyway. So now I have that. That's how I create all the shading colors. And so these colors down here, if I select these and slide them over, you can see it does the same thing. So that principle works for any hue. Now, when you're doing a lighter value hue, let's say you're doing shading for gold, you cheat a little bit. You don't want to add a lot of black to that because it looks muddy and gross. Uh, that's where you'd want to add a little more of the magenta. So you get that richness, but it still darkens the hue and works great for shading. So that's how I would approach that. Here's all the final detailing on the tiger here. Once again, I apply this principle even on this kind of detailing on the nose. So the nose itself, again, would just have that applied to those shapes to create all the detailing here. Sometimes when I create detailing, um, it might be in the wrong location like this. So I'll just copy, select the teeth, go into this, select the area it needs to go behind and go Command-B to paste behind to put it in the proper hierarchy so it reads right. So I just wanted to show you that. Now, what really brings a design like this to life is the hot spots, especially in the eyes gives everything character, looks a lot better. And it was after I got to this point, I set the file aside, came back to it the next day. I was going to finish up with some, some texturing. I knew I wanted to do that. But then as I was looking at it, I go, I think we need a little more. And one of those things I thought was it needs more darker shadows on the tongue. So I created this shape. And I'll just select it, sample the shading color I have, copy it to the clipboard. I'm going to click into this isolation mode, select this tongue detail, and paste behind to put it in the proper hierarchy. And I think that looks a lot better uh, than what I had. Now, I wanted to add some kanji to it. So we're going to go over that right now. And this is the kanji I'm going to bring into this design for the year of the tiger. And uh, the reason why I have a rectangle here is because I want to turn this into not such a geometric rectangle. I want it to be more free form. So I'm going to use an elliptical tool. Let's go ahead and just apply the styling to it. And I can align it or base it off of the triangle I did, and then I'll select anchors and I'll just pull it out because um, I think there's the term they call this where it's a circle, it's like a square circle, they call it squircle, I don't know, something like that. I, I've heard it called something like that. I, I may be wrong in that respect, but it's something like that. It's basically not a, not a square, not a circle, it's a combination of both, and that's kind of what I want to do here. And so that's how I do it on uh, 
the horizontal anchors for that shape, we can go ahead and get rid of this rectangle now, but it's still too rounded. I want it to be a little more, I don't know, a, a little more adjusted. But how do you do that? How can, I wish in Illustrator you could select each of the handle ends so they're both selected and go scale and it would just scale it, but you can't. So I'm going to show you a plugin I use where I just select these two anchors. I go to file, I go to script, I go to extend handles. And in this case, you put in a percentage you want. Now, this is an old, old script that I've been using for many, many, many years. And it's included in the exercise files for this movie. I'll put 170. So just watch where it is now. And when I click it, it just kind of makes that kind of shape. Now I'll go ahead and make a, a color application where it's just the same fill. I'll select this, paste it behind the kanji like this. And in the case of this design, I don't even want this colored. We're just going to use it to minus front out of the back of the shape we just created. And I think that looks uh, really cool. The last thing I'm going to add is a couple uh, textures. Now keep in mind, uh, save your old toothbrushes because these are textures I made with an old toothbrush, watered down acrylic paint, black acrylic paint, and just flicked it at paper. I made these like 15 years ago and I'm still using them. Just make sure when you make them, you scan it in using a flatbed scanner at a very high resolution. That way you can use it for all different sizes of art, but it's really great. So in this case, this first texture, we're just going to go to the swatches. We're going to color it white, but I obviously don't want it to look like that. So I'll go to transparency. We're going to knock down the value by half to 50. And this is just to get some nice artifacting in it. We'll turn on this layer, exact same pattern, but we can just simply rotate it 180 degrees so it doesn't align with what we already had. And all we're going to do here is we're going to apply that nice dark blue we have to this. And we're going to apply a blend mode of multiply, but we don't want it super dark. We're going to knock off 80% down to 20 on the value. And you can see how it interacts with the artwork like this. So this is how um, I use textures in the context of vector art. I like to say textures give vector art humanity. So uh, creating a tiger theme art and design is always a blast. I'm looking forward to the dragon theme in a few years. That's going to be a fun one. And have some ideas on next year's rabbit theme as well, hopping around in my head already. If you struggle with drawing, that's normal. If you don't do it on a regular basis, I highly recommend a blog by the Etherton brothers called How to Think When You Draw. It's the single best free resource on drawing tutorials on the internet, in my opinion. So check the link in the description below or just Google how to think when you draw and you're going to find their site, a blog actually. If you like this movie, please consider sharing a link to your to my YouTube channel on your social media. I'd really appreciate that a lot. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe as well. I have a lot more movies I'm developing. And if you're subscribed, you'll be notified when they're added. Thank you for watching People Love Process. I hope this content helps you to improve your own creative process.